Morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out. We know it's early. It's Friday. Getting you that much closer to the weekend, obviously, but a lot of fun stuff planned here over the next couple of days. I feel like I should begin by telling you if you're actually looking for the volleyball festival that's downstairs, but hopefully this will be equally entertaining. As you heard, my name is Adam Kaufman. Last year, I had the great, uh, great privilege to welcome everyone to DraftKings' first annual sports gaming innovation challenge right here at the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. And of course, today, it is my pleasure to welcome you back. If you're here for the first time, you've got uh, something really fun ahead of you. I'm not sure how many of you are unfamiliar at all with DraftKings. Our growing company, though, headquartered right here in Boston, not too far away from here, offers daily and weekly fantasy sports contests across 15 professional sports leagues and uh, all the ones you would expect, of course, the uh, big four, if you will, NFL, NHL, NBA, MLB, there's golf, there's NASCAR, there's even the XFL now as that league has uh, gotten underway, NASCAR, so many different things. If you're not familiar with how Daily Fantasy works, DFS, as you'll commonly hear it referred to in the industry, pretty basic to understand. Most lineups uh, will have a $50,000 limit. The idea is you create a fantasy team of players based on salary cap format, and of course, that your limit more often than not. You have to be very strategic in whom you draft for your team because each athlete costs a different amount of money. And then you acquire points based on each athlete's real life performance, and then from there, basically, the lineup with the most points ends up winning a contest. In addition, of course, to our fantasy sports offerings, which had been around for years, in 2018, we launched DraftKings Sportsbook in New Jersey, following the Supreme Court's decision to overturn a previous law banning sports betting. And our sports betting platform continues to grow really rapidly as we enter new states. Today, DraftKings is an ever-expanding sports technology and entertainment platform that spans fantasy, sports betting, digital media, and much more. I'm sharing this because you'll need to know this background information for today's competition. All of our finalists certainly well aware. For the past month, these students that we will hear from today, teams, individuals, they've been developing business innovation ideas to enhance our daily fantasy and or sports betting offerings. They will be presenting those innovations to our esteemed panel of judges and all of you this morning. Finalists were narrowed down to five. Just five teams from an influx of submissions. These five will be presenting in front of you today here in just a little bit once I get through my spiel, obviously. Finalists will be judged on the following criteria. The innovation and ambition behind the idea, the product's user interface and user experience, the overall quality of the product, and the overall impact of the product. The winners will be announced just as soon as we're done here, live, right in front of you following the presentations. First place will receive a $2,000 team cash prize, an internship with DraftKings, and lunch with DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins, who also will be speaking on two panels here today in the Bill James Room right upstairs, just in case you're still mapping out your day. Second place, four tickets to a basketball or baseball game, along with a $500 team cash prize. Third place, four tickets to a basketball or baseball game and a $250 team cash prize. All right, let's get to our revered group of judges here to my right. Jeff Scott, DraftKings Vice President of Product. Matt LaRue, Director of Fantasy Sports Revenue. Christina Chase, Senior Lecturer at MIT and Founder of the MIT Sports Lab. Jeff Ma, Co-Host, Bet the Process and ESPN Sports Betting Commentator. And Matthew Berry, ESPN Senior Fantasy Sports Analyst. I'd also like to just quickly add, I found these presentations last year to be fascinating, and I see all of your same inspired, innovative thinking each and every day, walking the halls of DraftKings, the hundreds of people that we come across every day. I'm looking forward to seeing what all of you guys will leave us with here today. With that, let's bring out our first finalist from Harvard Business School. Please welcome Liz Bloom. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today and for taking the time to listen to our pitches. 
Uh, my name is Liz Bloom. I'm a joint degree student at Harvard Business School and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. So unfortunately, we'll not be winning any prizes for longest distance travel, I don't think. Um, and I'm here today to pitch the idea of prize-linked savings accounts as a new way to play fantasy sports, and specifically fantasy football, on DraftKings. So most of you are probably wondering, what on earth are prize-linked savings accounts? So PLSAs are gamified financial vehicles that encourage unbanked and underbanked people to establish savings. And the idea is that if savings is a fun and competitive activity, more people will do it. So PLSAs essentially replace sort of traditional interest-bearing accounts with sort of lottery tickets. And you receive a lottery ticket for good behavior and for repeatedly putting in a deposit each week. And at the end of the month, your credit union or bank will essentially run a lottery and give you the opportunity to win a large cash prize or a new car or something very exciting. And it's basically the, the small chance of getting something like that versus the kind of boring but known quantity of getting small interest payments each month. And these accounts have been used around the world, actually, um, in South Africa, the United Kingdom, and the US as well, in several states. And at this point, about 300,000 PLSAs have been opened, resulting in nearly $700 million in savings since 2009. So you're probably wondering what this has to do with fantasy sports. So I'm sure many of us are concerned with the student debt crisis in this country. And it turns out that the demographics of fantasy sports players tends to overlay pretty closely with the demographics of young people who lack savings, as you can see from the statistics here. So I think PLSAs and DraftKings can really help unbanked and underbanked young people grow savings and pay down student debt. And on a sort of larger philosophical level, uh, I think PLSAs could recast the role of sports betting and fantasy sports in American society. And I know that DraftKings is already quite concerned with the issue of responsible gaming. And I think PLSAs could be a really excellent tool to sort of further that mission. So let me explain a little bit about how this would work. And we'll follow along with a typical PLSA customer. We'll call him Tom. Uh, Tom is a resident of Massachusetts. He loves Massachusetts. He has no intention of leaving Massachusetts anytime soon. And Tom's goal is essentially to earn as many tokens as possible. So tokens are like those lottery tickets or raffle tickets that I mentioned before. Each token represents a chance to win a monthly prize, whether that's DraftKings merchandise or large cash prizes. And you just want to acquire as many tokens as possible, because more tokens means more chances to win. And there are two ways to acquire tokens. One is by making a deposit each week. And the other is by playing in a PLSA fantasy contest that you are eligible to play in by virtue of having made that deposit. So in Tom's case, Tom opens up his first PLSA with a $25 minimum deposit through DraftKings. And with this deposit, he gets his first token and his first uh, daily fantasy contest entry. And so he can continue to earn more and more tokens each week by making a deposit and then being eligible to play in a contest. And therefore, by doing well in the contest, he can continue to acquire more and more tokens. So I should also clarify that the deposit that he's making is his to keep. So unlike other family sports or sports betting contests, it's not a traditional kind of buy-in. We want to encourage people to make the deposit and establish savings. So the point of the, of the $25 is essentially to buy a token and to get the right to earn more and more tokens. And the money that he's depositing into his account are, is his to keep. So each month, at the end of the month, 
Tom's Credit Union will run a raffle and disperse prizes to PLSA players whose tokens were drawn. So by virtue of the fact that Tom did extremely well in his fantasy contest each week, he acquired a ton of tokens, and he was able to win $1,000 at the end of the month, in addition to having saved 100 bucks as well. And he's thrilled with his experience, and of course, that just reinforces his idea that he does not want to leave Massachusetts anytime soon. So this begs the question, how exactly can anybody make money off of something like this? So I propose essentially two revenue streams for DraftKings. And first of all, I should note that this would require establishing a joint venture of some sort with a credit union. And I think banks will be interested in doing this JV in order to attract young customers to sticky banking banks. So Acquiring customers for banks is quite expensive, actually, but once you hook them, they tend to be pretty sticky. They don't want to switch between banks because the switching costs are pretty high. It's annoying to move your, bank, your money from one bank to another. So, for example, I've had the same bank since I was eight years old or something, and I don't think there's any chance I'll be leaving anytime soon. So it's really, especially at the age that we're talking about, exciting prospect for a credit union to be able to acquire a customer who doesn't already have a savings account. So this brings the first uh, source of revenue, which would be a fee that the credit union would pay to DraftKings for each new account that's opened through PLSAs. And I sort of targeted this at around $300. Um, the customer acquisition cost for credit unions is about $400 to $700, according to research. So this would actually represent a potential savings for the credit union, so they would be incentivized to do this. The second source of revenue would be on money withdrawn from DraftKings PLSAs to credit union accounts. So when I was speaking with folks from DraftKings in the course of creating this presentation, they mentioned that it's actually a negative revenue driver whenever anybody wants to take money off of the DraftKings site. It costs DraftKings about three bucks to cut that check. So the credit unions could essentially come in and pay for that cost, assuming the customer took the money off of the PLSA and into another credit union account. Now, why would the credit union want to do this? Well, if someone is putting money from a PLSA into another account, Presumably, that means they're opening up new products with the credit union. And that also means additional assets under management for the credit union. So to me, it sort of seems like a win-win for both the credit union and for DraftKings, in addition to being a win for the customer who gets to establish savings without any risk to his or her cash. And the gaming would take place within the DraftKings platforms. Um, I suggest an initial pilot with fantasy football. Given the weekly nature of football, I think it sort of lends itself well to building a weekly savings habit. Um, I think additional sports could be rolled out uh, throughout the program in order to encourage year-round savings as well. And that is the idea of PLSA for fantasy football. Thank you so much for listening, and I will gladly take any questions. Liz, thank you very much. Judges, you have five minutes for your questions. So um, I, I love the idea. Um, one concern I have, and I don't know how much you've thought about this, but what kind of licensing issues do you think there are for the banks? Like, I think banks would love this, right? And I think, like, the best partner would be, like, someone like a SoFi or, like, a Robin Hood or something like that. Yeah, that's a great question. The reason I mentioned credit unions is that credit unions tend to be the ones that are doing this right now because they are either a nonprofit or they have small amounts of asset or management, and they tend to not have some of the brand considerations, I think, that a lot of larger institutions would have. Um, I love the idea of partnering with a fintech company. I think that's, that's not something I had actually considered. I think that's certainly a possibility. You probably do run into some issues of whose brand is more valuable to whom and you know, who's actually licensing to whom. But uh, I, I do like the idea. But like I said, credit unions tend to be the focus just because 
they see the value in establishing these kinds of products and helping um, unbanked people sort of build savings. What I've asked about is like the government licensing. Like I don't know what the what is the DFS licensing that you guys use. Like is it as bad as what the um, typical like sports book stuff is, or is it because like then the credit unions or the banks like everyone that works for them would have I mean like all the executives would have to get licensed, right? Which is like a oh, very I see big... what you're saying. I see what you're saying. I thought you meant licensing from a brand standpoint. Yeah. Um. <laughs> That's a good question. There's actually federal legislation that was introduced in 2014, I want to say, that basically permitted these type products to take place. So I don't know if that would thus give the credit union sort of special dispensation to be able to be licensed under that law. And state laws are a little bit iffy, which is why some of the states that have this are kind of patchwork. But yeah, that's a good question. I guess I'll have to get back to you. Uh, I assume that you are assuming these are going to be separate accounts. That, like, if I'm a player on DraftKings and then I also want to set up a savings account on DraftKings, that they're, they're two separate accounts, right? That you don't want to mingle the accounts. Well, I think in an ideal world, it would be as unified of an experience as possible, um, in part because I think it would be cool to be able to transfer some of your deposits that you've already made from DraftKings into your PLSA and then into a separate account uh, held by the credit union. So I sort of see them as being a sort of unified product. But again, the sort of legal concerns or considerations with that might be problematic. I'm just not particularly familiar with that. Yeah, I, that would be my concern. I think you would want to, if you're like, hey, this is a savings account, there's just even the optics of it. Like, hey, young people, we're trying to get you to save, but make sure you spend it on DraftKings Millionaire Maker every weekend or whatever. You know, like I just, I think the, you know, the goal of it to say, hey, this industry is just, we're going to incentivize, especially young people to learn how to start saving and, yeah. um, you know, taking a portion of their paycheck every week. That makes total sense and that's great. But then once you can access that money, I, my take actually would be to make it harder like that, you know, like that you want them to have a separate account so that it's actually, they have to go through a f couple of hoops to get the money out of the savings account into their quote unquote DraftKings Sportsbook DFS account, right? I mean, just like, if the idea of, the, because for me, the, the idea of this is, that, is, is more optics, right? I mean, I'll let the DraftKings guys speak to the monetization of it, but feels like it's a lot of work to try to get, you know, a 300 buck, uh, you know, it's it's probably a lot of back end work and a lot of marketing to explain this idea, just to you know try to convert people to get three hundred bucks from a bank. So for me, it's to me it's a publicity play. And it, by the way, which is important, especially as sports gambling becomes more uh, prevalent throughout all the states. But that would be my feedback: is that I actually think you want to like it's a savings account, and we're going to have small cash prizes, similar to how the banks are doing it every month to incentivize new customer experience and, you know, uh, good publicity. Yeah, I guess the, the reason why I like having it be as sort of fluid of an experience as possible if that is, is that if someone has to start with the credit union account, they're not going to create the account in the first place. So I like the idea of saying, you know, with DraftKings users, they're used to doing things with their money every single week, but they're not necessarily used to sort of putting it in and expecting it to grow over time. Or maybe that's real, but it's more of an entertainment product. So I see this as sort of a, a complement, not necessarily a substitute. So I would hope it would be kind of MPV positive for, for DraftKings. But I totally understand the, con the concerns. Yeah, overall, I love the concept. I think you know, we're always looking to reinvest in the community. And so this is something, to Matt's point, that you know, we can always, Matthew's point, uh, we can always use as a way to like, kind of make the product seem a lot more socially acceptable and something that's actually beneficial to you know, young people that are in the demographic that we, uh, that we interact with. Uh, one suggestion, less of a question, but could be maybe thinking of it less around the idea of <clears throat> getting credits or tokens, but maybe what you do is actually leverage the benefit of 
setting up these savings accounts is getting tickets into the existing contests and, and games that we're already running at DraftKings anyways, right? And so the value prop is that, hey, if you deposit at least $1,000 in your savings account, you still keep the two accounts separate, but we'll give you a free entry mm. into this weekly contest that we're running for a million dollars anyways, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. So you're getting the value prop from that. Additionally, you could advertise to DraftKings users who already see value in those entries to those contests to then set up a savings account because they'll start getting regular free entries into those contests by having yeah. a savings account. Could be yeah, that's a great idea as well. Yeah. yeah, I was definitely struggling with the monetization and kind of user experience just because it is so hard to design it in such a way that it's actually attractive to all three parties. Hey, it's Jeff. Um, yeah, I was wondering where you thought in the flow of onboarding and like signing up for a bank account while you're on the DraftKings product. Obviously, we're trying to convert users into in different ways. Like, where do you, where do you see the entry point uh, for the product for like me to take the time to set up this account? I, I was thinking of it as being on the DraftKings app and essentially sort of treating it like a different sort of. Uh, uh, product or game that someone could play, and it would just sort of be promoted as, oh, this is a new sort of way for you to use your entertainment dollars each week, or maybe in addition to the entertainment dollars that you have used. Um, I think I'm being flagged down. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Liz Bloom, thank you very much. It was great. We appreciate it. We're ready for our second presenter from Cornell University, Patrick Neepsey. Thanks. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Neepsey. I'm a junior at Cornell University. I'm studying information science and business. Um, I'm really proud to share with you guys a brand new approach to daily fantasy sports. Uh, it's called Eclipse. Um, the purpose of Eclipse is to combine daily fantasy sports concepts with gambling fundamentals. Uh, as gambling is legalized in more states across the country, uh, there's more opportunities to acquire new sportsbook customers uh, for DraftKings. Um, what better way to attract current daily fantasy users to the DraftKings sportsbook than by combining the principles of both? Uh, Eclipse is a refreshing take on daily fantasy football, uh, football that will appeal to gambl gamblers and fantasy football fans alike. The basic premise of Eclipse is simple. Each entrant must select a lineup of players from a pool, just like normal daily fantasy contests. However, instead of a dollar value, each player is priced with a money line odds value, and there's no salary cap like in traditional daily fantasy sports games. Uh, odds prices are derived from a win probability added value assigned to each eligible player. The goal of the win probability added metric is to quantify a player's value in the context of their alternatives. Uh, in other words, the value represents the player's win probability above replacement uh, for each given contest criteria. Um, as a user fills out his lineup, a lineup price is calculated by taking the sum of the odds prices uh, in the lineup. Uh, since money line odds don't have any values between positive and negative 100, the sum is taken with this formula. Um, the formula takes the sum over all the odds prices of the difference between a player's price and even money, which is represented by plus or minus 100. Um, the sum is then added to positive 100 if it is greater than zero or negative 100 otherwise. Uh, the resulting money line value represents the lineup price for a user's entry. The lineup price determines the risk versus reward for a user's entry. Just like in gambling, an entry with a higher probability of success will net a lower payout and vice versa. For example, if a user enters a $10 lineup with a price of plus 120, they will win $12 for a win and lose their $10 entry fee for a loss. Otherwise, or excuse me, um, alternatively, if their lineup is priced at minus 120, they will only win $8.33 for a win and then lose their $10 for a loss. Uh, this format removes the traditional salary cap limitations, but it preserves the element of skill that's crucial for success in playing daily fantasy. Uh, there's two different types of Eclipse contests. The first, and likely the most popular option, is called the point contest. Uh, in this format, each contest variation has a set lineup size and point total. Um, if a user score eclipses this point total, they are considered a winner, and they are paid out according to their lineup price. 
Otherwise, their entry loses. Uh, there's a number of different variations of point contests, some of which are listed here. So for example, you have different lineup sizes, five, seven, nine, and different lineup floors for each of those sizes. So for example, this is an example of a five player 60 point contest. Uh, the user would need to select five players whose combined score they think will be more than 60 fantasy points. Uh, in this sample lineup, the user's picks netted him a lineup price of minus 130. So if the entry fee for this contest were $10, the user would win $7.69 if their score was greater than or equal to 60. The second Eclipse contest is called a classic contest. This format resembles more traditional daily fantasy contests in the sense that users are competing against each other instead of shooting for a particular score. Um, this format may not be as appealing to traditional gamblers because there's a lot more variability and it's a much less uh, statistically driven um, uh, concept, but uh, it's important to have a contest that looks and feels like daily fantasy so that inexperienced gamblers and uh, primarily DFS players feel comfortable um, embracing this new format. Um, like the point contest, the classic contest also has a number of different variations for users to choose from. So 50-50, standard elite, and you can definitely be more creative with that. Um, at the end of the day, DraftKings is a business and any daily fantasy game needs to be profitable in order to operate. Uh, Eclipse can achieve this by setting odds prices with a built-in margin in the similar way to how sports books uh, stay profitable. So this is an example of uh, money line odds values graphed against um, win probabilities. Uh, the dashed blue line represents the implied probability uh, derived from each money line odds value on the uh, x-axis. Uh, as you'll notice, it's uh, not a linear relationship, so it would be impossible to add and subtract odds prices from each other without straying too far from the curve. Uh, the red line you can see is a linear equation that um, I, I modeled and, uh, and came up with that um, is used to set odds prices for uh, players in the lineup based on their win probability added values. Um, for example, the implied odds for a win probability of 50% is even money. But in the Eclipse equation, you can see it is minus 105, as represented by the black dot there on the screen. Um, this is a couple uh, sample lineup calculations that uh, I did in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, as you can see, the win probability added values are calculated with a normal distribution in this example. Uh, my long-term goal for Eclipse is to build out a probability model based on historical data and player projections to get the most accurate prices possible. Um, you know, IBM Watson does uh, distributions of fantasy projections uh, for ESPN, and uh, DraftKings has a lot of historical data that's available to users and employees that uh, can be leveraged to uh, really get an edge um, when creating these margins. So as you can see the, uh, in the top lineup, the, um, the uh, price would be minus 142 uh, when their real value is minus 114. These correlate to uh, implied probabilities of 58.7%, 53.3%, creating a margin of 5.4% for the book. Similarly, uh, in the bottom lineup, the uh, odds are plus 116, which correlates to a 46.3 implied win probability. Does this work? Sorry. Uh, and uh, the real win probability is 42.5%, which creates a margin of 3.8%. These margins fluctuate between 3.5% and 5.5% on average. Uh, a contest like Eclipse that utilizes both gambling and daily fantasy con concepts can attract users to the DraftKings Sportsbook in states where gambling legislation has recently been passed. Um, this would reduce the customer acquisition cost for the DraftKings Sportsbook by bringing in new users that are already using the daily fantasy interface, but have not experienced the gambling side of it. Um, once this is uh, implemented with football, it can also, this model can also be applied to any of the other major sports, including NBA, NHL, MLB, EPL, PGA Tour, et cetera. Um, the fantasy sports industry is growing by the day. 
veterans and rookies alike are constantly searching for unique and innovative ways to play fantasy sports, uh, I believe Eclipse has a, is a concept that has the potential to really grip the nation. Thank you. Any questions? Patrick, thank you. Judges, we again open it up to your thoughts and questions. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Yeah, so um, in theory, I mean, this is basically like a player prop parlay, right? You're essentially saying these players have the following odds to eclipse these point totals, and if they do, you'll get paid out based on the probability of that happening. Mm -hmm. um, explain to me then if someone's able to like build a lineup in what you're describing as a classic contest, right? And they build a lineup that has probability that translates to like minus 180 odds. Mm -hmm. and someone else has one that's plus 180. If the person who hits the plus 180, they would they would win. Like, how basically, how would you rank the winners in, in a peer-to-peer -peer competition that's set up like this? So you didn't describe that in the presentation. So one of the biggest differences between this method and uh, traditional daily fantasy is that uh, in, in DFS contests now, users are paid out kind of according to their uh, standing. So first would get more money than second, more money than third, et cetera. The difference with Eclipse is that it's binary. So it is, if you are in the winning threshold, you are paid out as a winner. And if you're not, you're paid out as a loser. So uh, if, like you said, if someone with plus 180 in a classic contest uh, finished in whatever the top X percent uh, dictated by that classic contest, they would be paid out at plus 180 compared to their entry fee. Uh, similarly, if, if someone at minus 180 won in a classic contest, they would be paid out according to their fee. Uh, the, the, um, the wrinkle with classic contests is that um, it's a little bit tougher to uh, predict these, um, the actual margins just because uh, you don't necessarily know what score needs to be considered the, the baseline, if you will. Um, and that's why I think the point contest is something that um, should definitely be emphasized. And that's definitely the flagship contest for this uh, model. Um, yeah, did I, does that answer your question? So there's obviously DFS, there's sports betting, there's player props. Where do you think this fits into the ecosystem? Why, and why do you think that this is a, an important thing to do? Uh, that's a great question. Um, my uh, thinking is that this would be a, um, this contest would be available on the, in the daily fantasy interface. Obviously, this is something that is subject to the legal side of all of that. Um, I, I personally believe that there's enough skill-based um, gaming in this idea that it would qualify as a daily fantasy product. Um, obviously, that's something that uh, there's been a lot of legislation on and, and is uh, still kind of in, in courts. So um, the alternative would be it would be an offering on the sports book. Uh, and, um, I think the, it fits into this ecosystem in a way that it basically bridges the gap between the, the daily fantasy side, the DFS side, and the sportsbook side, and kind of brings users from one side to the other. So ultimately, you think it's a good like onboarding thing or yeah. a conversion from DFS to sports betting? Yeah, exactly right. <clears throat> I, I was just going to say, I, I mean, I, I think the, the overall concept of a DFS game that exposes people to sports betting concepts and gets them comfortable uh, with some of those ideas, I think is great. Uh, can you take me through sort of the onboarding of this? Because I'm just, uh, I understand sort of for the presentation, but I just think a typical user, the minute, like, if they saw the calculation, they're like, okay, I'm out. This is, you know what I mean? Like, I mm -hmm. think, I think, uh, I, this is something that I think we'll probably get into with the panel that Jeff and I are doing tomorrow, but mm -hmm. to me, uh, one of the issues or challenges of DFS that I think sports gambling will face in an even bigger way is explaining it to, to someone that's never done it before and not wanting to feel like, I don't want to feel dumb. I don't want to make a dumb bet. I don't want to go up against a shark, you know, so uh, I'm just going to, no thanks. Yeah. You know what I mean? So talk to me about how you onboard someone into explaining this game in a way that's fan friendly. Yeah, totally. That's a great question. Um, I think that the, the best way to, to explain that is by saying, um, by, by putting it side by side with DFS contests and, and highlighting the similarities between the two. 
um, in the sense that you have a lineup that you have to fill. You have to put certain positions in certain slots. You have to um, follow the given criteria. Um, and I think that um, it, you would definitely need a brief explanation of kind of how money line payouts work. I think that's probably the biggest onboarding hurdle for someone who is, is not a gambler and doesn't understand gambling concepts and money line odds and stuff like that. Um, but I think that uh, that explanation, um, once that kind of quick explanation is, is, is uh, read, um, users who aren't necessarily familiar with it will be able to kind of intuitively see uh, what they're supposed to do uh, just because of the interface similarities with DFS. And then obviously once they play and once they um, kind of get a sense of how lineups win and the strategy of it, I think that it's something that can um, start with users participating in Eclipse and then once it can really help them get a better understanding for money line odds and for gambling fundamentals and that can lead to um, introducing them to the sports book and, and sports betting. So just a, just a suggestion, because again, like the overall concept of, hey, this is a DFS fantasy game that's basically going to get you used to gambling concepts mm -hmm. and make it an easier bridge, mm -hmm. I think is great. But just a, a suggestion and maybe a way to make it a little bit more uh, simple and fan friendly is instead of making it about the payouts, why not make the money line basically correspond with the fantasy points? You know how like in a showdown, you can choose a captain that's 1.5x? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why not get away with a salary cap and then literally like what the points are is based on their money line? So the people, you know, like you're gonna choose Patrick Mahomes, you're gonna earn basically, you know, you might even earn quote unquote negative points, if you will. Like he scores 22, but his money line is whatever. So it's actually, yeah. he winds up with 18, but he's money in the bank, so to speak. But if you choose Daniel Jones and he goes off because he's at, you know, yeah. plus 150, then you're earning one point. You know what I mean? Like I, that may be a simpler way uh -huh. to do the same concept and people can understand like, I want to, you know, I, I, yeah. you know, they're filling out a, a DraftKings lineup the way they normally would, which is they're taking some sure things and they're taking some long shots. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really great uh, concept. I think Just I'm getting thought. flagged. So thank you guys very much for uh, for listening. Patrick Neefsey, thank you very much. Time to ring up our third presenter from Northwestern Kellogg, and that is Michael Suka. Adam. All right, Mike, I'm just going to do a couple tests. You set, told me to spit some bars, so it sounds like this is working. All right, uh, hello and good morning. As Adam said, my name is Mike Sukup. I'm a Master's of Data Science candidate at Northwestern University, and I'm here to talk about my innovative sports betting product, Draft Funds. So what are Draft Funds? So draft funds are the integration of sports betting and mutual funds. Generally speaking, draft funds will be funds of money which will place a bet of the same nominal value on multiple sporting events within the fund's target scope. So specifically how this will work, individual investors will pool their money together and a fund manager at draft funds will manage those assets and execute the bets. The bets will generate returns and those returns will be redistributed back to the draft fund shareholders. I think an example also helps tie this concept together. So consider an NFL fan who loves rooting on underdogs. Well, a draft fund could be created that would place a money line bet on the underdog for the, every game of an, of an NFL season. That way, over the course of the season and that fan's watching the NFL, anytime the underdog won, that fan could profit. So draft funds will take a general sports betting strategy and execute that strategy over a high volume of games. So draft funds would be a DraftKings sportsbook product offering. And ideally, DraftKings would put together a portfolio or catalog of these fund offerings that individuals could review and research so they can understand the fund's target scope and objective, the bets that fund would place, the price per share, prior year's performance, and also potential future outlook of that fund. When an individual finds a fund that they want to select because they like the betting strategy or because they think they can maximize some of their returns, 
while protecting their downside, they can do so in a self-service manner on the DraftKings platforms. From there, DraftKings takes over. They manage the funds at cost, providing an alternative revenue stream for the company. And then during the life of the fund, draft funds can provide fund performance tracking on their digital platforms. Then when the fund matures, DraftKings will place the returns to the fund's owners back into their user's account balance. So here's an example of profitability tracking of a fund that'd be housed within the DraftKings Sportsbook online platform. This example shows the week-to-week -week cumulative profitability of a fund that placed the money line bet on the underdog for every game of the 2018 NFL regular season. This fund would have returned 8.3% to shareholders. It proves out the potential for the profitability of these funds while helping to mitigate the user's risk by reducing the volatility associated with sports betting. <laughs> Additionally, I think profit tracking such as this, along with a statistical and information breakdown of the fund's performance, will drive users to DraftKings as they want to learn about their returns and also learn how to make better future bets. And I think DraftKings can leverage this in order to prescribe and recommend other bets that user could have made on the DraftKings platform while introducing them to the world of sports betting. So the goal of draft funds is to increase DraftKings user volume and revenue by converting fans and sports enthusiasts into active sports bettors. With the rapid legalization of state-to-state -state sports betting, I think the time is ripe to, to capitalize on the opportunity to convert sports fandom into sports bets as betting becomes more accessible to millions of Americans. And I think draft funds is a product that can help achieve this because it mitigates the user's risk while introducing the user to the exciting, potentially profitable, but often intimidating world of sports betting. Additionally, draft funds can provide a convenient approach for casual bettors to get action on a high volume of games with a single transaction. This passive approach to sports betting will ensure that the user's bets are always in on a timely manner and shifts the focus more to watching, enjoying the games, and the, and the excitement and drama that ensues. So I think DraftKings and draft funds are a perfect fit. With draft funds, there's the opportunity to pair the first US company to offer legal online and mobile sports betting with the first ever self-service sports betting mutual fund, which would further ingrain DraftKings as the leader in this market space. Additionally, DraftKings could use draft funds as a promotional offer to entice fans and grow their user base, especially when deploying in new areas. For instance, consider DraftKings Sportsbook deploying their services in Dallas. Well, draft funds could be set up that would track the performance of the Mavs or the Cowboys and offer to users in this market space as a sign-up bonus. DraftKings already revolutionized fantasy sports. And with draft funds, I think DraftKings has the opportunity to revolutionize sports betting altogether. That's my speech, thank you. Judges. Um, what do you anticipate the expected ROI would be for these funds? So for these funds, it really depends on what you invest in and how long that scope is. So for instance, like I tracked the 40 year history if you were to bet the unders on every single NFL game and the historic ROI is like minus 3%, but you can capitalize on small, market or small fluctuations in season. So like for instance, betting on the Chicago Bears to take the, against the spread every game in 2018 would have returned you like 35%. So it really depends on the fund's target scope, the time frame, and what bet you're making. But you can see... Right, but overall, right, you're, you're like pitching this as an investment vehicle, right? Yeah, right. Investment vehicles typically have positive ROI. Do you think, think this will have a positive or negative ROI over the course of these funds? I think you can achieve positive ROI. No, but over all of them. Over all of them? Yes. So it would be negative to the user, but positive to DraftKings. Right. Right. Is that good? So that's not, it's not a long-term investment strategy. It's more of a, it's an alternative short-term investment. So you're not having the underlying assumption, like if you're investing in securities in the stock market, of there always being a 5 to 6% increase. You're more trying to, to, to get new users into betting by not losing their shirt in a single bet. So it's not a long-term investment vehicle. It's more of a short-term market fluctuation try, you're trying to seize the opportunity on. I'm curious, are there any regulatory concerns? 
Yeah, so that's something I've definitely tried to look into. And so like the SEC would classify anything, anytime someone in, pools their money together, expecting returns as a security. But there are hedge funds currently in existence, like contrarian investments, that are doing something similar that aren't subject, they say it on their website, they're not subject to SEC regulations. So I think it is a gray area right now where the SEC would classify something like this as a security, but there's been no formal court casing on what you would have to do moving forward. So that is something where I think as the market progressed with this, the, the legislation would be defined further. Do you envision a, a scenario where this is more of a platform product where individuals could just set their own thresholds as opposed to taking some sort of uh, fund that's set up by DraftKings or a third party? Right, so you're, you're speaking about an individually created mutual fund. Yeah, I feel like that might product. be like where the real meat is here, right? Where someone's saying, you know, hey, <clears throat> as long as these five teams are facing the following scenarios and the price is better than X, just passively bet on those for me so that I don't need to be in front of my computer or on my phone to place the bet at that time. Um, that's something that could actually drive value to the user as opposed to um, you know, having something that they don't have as much control over potentially that you know, addresses Jeff's concerns where you know, if you personally have your own theory or f feeling that you have a, a strategy that's going to be revenue positive to you, you're not you know, looking at some projection from DraftKings, you're kind of building it yourself, but using this as a vehicle to passively place those wagers, that could be a, a way of implementing this that's, that's valuable to all parties. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's definitely the potential. I mean, what I was trying to aim with these funds was how do you convert the millions of Americans who are now going to have sports betting accessible who are unfamiliar with it, how do you get them into a bet, potentially make some profit and not lose their shirt? I mean, there are options where you could have these funds be actively managed. You could have markets established for these funds, and you can also have uh, you know, the user set up their own types of bets and funds that they want to place. That's more of the evolving product portfolio of where this thing could go. Do you, uh, do you foresee this just being a kind of, you log into DraftKings and they're just all sort of presented, or is there any sort of, for lack of a better phrase, personality with this? I just sort of think about like, uh, <laughs> who knows, maybe, well, the day's early. But um, no, what I was gonna say is, is like just, you know, when I think about like sort of investment in mutual funds, whether it's, whether it's your local guy at Charles Schwab or whatever, that usually there's some sort of financial advisor you know, that, that most people don't, quote, uh, invest on themselves, we invest by themselves. And so it feels like for this, you would want, whether it's a DraftKings expert or somebody, you would want somebody to say, like, here's why I've put together, you know, the Chicago Bears unders for the le next four weeks or something like that, as opposed to just, here's sort of, right, because otherwise it's just a sports book, here's every bet available, but it feels like for something like this, you'd want some sort of expert or some sort of personality around it to say, here's why I've grouped this particular thing and here's why I think it's a good investment. Right, that's definitely an option, right? You could have a, a Matt Berry fund, you put together your picks for this week of the NFL, you could buy into that. It gives an, uh, it gives an extra management expense to DraftKings to manage those portfolios. It's an extra revenue expense to them. You get partners on board and it can definitely grow the user base. What I was envisioning is just trying to take Vanguard and put it on the DraftKings Sportsbook platform. There's so many op, op, different avenues you could take this to try to maximize the, the revenue potential, for sure. I, I would recommend a Jeff Ma branded one, pers personally. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Mike, thank you very much. Great, thank you for your time. Okay, we're ready for our fourth presenter and uh, closest commuter from MIT, Asher Wright. Cool. So thank you for having me, everyone. I'm Asher. I'm from MIT Sloan in a Master of Business Analytics program. And I'm here to pitch profit contests, which are contests specifically designed for analytics players um, and target and embrace analytics. So the way they work is DraftKings chooses a sport like the NBA, and they choose a statistic like field goals attempted. Uh, and then they create an eligible pool of players, of NBA players in this case. Um, that can also just extend to all players. And then a competitor comes along and he or she selects uh, 10 players from that, drafting them, 
and predicts the given stat for each of those players. So you're actually trying to predict every single stat for each player, or, or the one stat for each player. So an interface looks like this. It's very similar to the existing sort of daily fantasy competitions. Um, the key difference is on the right here, where now there, there's an input for you to collect the prediction for that player. So in this case, uh, the competitor has said that Luka Doncic is going to get 26 uh, field goals attempted in this case. The player enters, or sorry, the competitor enters in all of the predictions and submits, and the closer they are to the actual field goals attempted, the higher their score. So coming into scoring, uh, the way it works is basically you look at how far off their score was on a percent level, and you invert it by doing 100, subtract that, so at the bottom here, you can see Luka Doncic, uh, the prediction was 26, the actual was 21, the percent error was 23.8, so his score is 100 minus 23.8. The reason you do a percent instead of an absolute value is that it is better for dissuading them from choosing low-scoring players. So if you want to try to manipulate the system by choosing someone you think is only going to get three field goals attempted and then he ends up getting two, you may think that's pretty close, one field goal off, when in reality that's a 50% error, so it hurts you a lot. Um, another quirk that comes out of this, which kind of leads to a cool experience, is that you have sort of, a, when a game is ongoing, you have two states a player can be in. The first state is they're on the rise, and the second state is they're on the decline. So you can see here, with Doncic, as his actual goes up, his score will increase because it will get closer to his prediction. For Wiggins, as his actual goes up, his score actually decreases because he's already passed the prediction. So uh, that made me think of how can we sort of make a really good sweat experience or an experience when these um, players are actually playing. So you log in and you have something that I've called the scoring mountain. You definitely need better UX than what I can do. But basically you have the prediction for each player at the top of the mountain and then you have where they are moving along the mountain. Um, and then you have this concept of tipping over the peak, which is, in this case, Chris, Chris Boucher has tipped over the peak, so now any, any score that he gets or any field goal attempted is going to actually decrease his overall score. I think this could be a really like, fun experience for people to log in and sort of watch as their player minutes remaining goes down and hope that the stars line up with the peaks of the mountains. Uh, so now I want to talk about why this competition is great for analytics. It comes down to the fact that this is a draft and predict competition, rather than right now we have mainly draft to maximize, and there's a fundamental difference there. So first is with the drafting, you have billions of possible drafts, which is the same as before, but now a lot more drafts are eligible. Like a draft with 10 bench players can actually come first in a competition, whereas in the current competitions, if you draft 10 bench players, you're not hitting your salary cap and you're gonna, um, you're gonna perform poorly. The second is that you have to identify which players are actually better for predicting which stats. So it might be that for field goals attempted, there are certain players or qualities of players that lead to them being much easier to predict. Uh, and then following that kind of plays into the fact that we're predicting stats that really haven't had as much attention before. So uh, that's kind of new opportunities. And now I want to talk about why analytical players should be targeted, and it really comes down to three things. One is there are a lot of them, and the second is they submit hundreds of lineups. They're not the casual guy logging in, submitting one lineup a week. They're submitting for any given competition, you know, 100, 200 lineups, um, and they participate in competitions every day, often. Uh, and the third, the third fact is that they're actually inherently excited to try new formats, because there's an edge from being the first to, uh, to sort of uh, apply analytics to something, is that if you can do well, it's extremely profitable. And so for a pilot, I think the NBA is a really good sport to start with because it has a bunch of high-valued uh, statistics. You target these analytical users who are submitting hundreds and, or tens even of lineups a day, and you start off with this contest player pool of just all eligible players. Um, and then finally, contest type, you use a tournament, and a top-heavy payout tournament, which is when a lot of the money is for the top few spots, and that's because from an analytics perspective, the ones who are submitting hundreds of lineups are usually uh, doing so in these tournaments where they can hope to, that one lineup will have really high payoff. And then there are a lot of extensions you can do with this. Some of them are sort of similar to the current uh, game modes, so you can have positional constraints like requiring a certain number of centers or point guards, et cetera. 
you can have player costs, but now the player costs are actually based on how stable the players are, not on how well they perform. Um, you can have bonuses, so awarding points if all the errors are within a certain threshold, or you can have bonuses where if you hit an exact prediction, it gives you a bonus 10 points. Um, and then with these contest player pools, you can start selecting them strategically and add a sort of another dimension of complexity. So you can select only bench players, or you can select only starters, or, or certain positions. Um, finally, you can still, I think it's meant for really those tournament contests, but you still can do them 50-50 or head-to-head. -head. I think a casual player will also really enjoy it and get a lot out of the experience of the, the mountain and watching it go, especially if he's head-to-head -head with a friend. Um, and finally, you can extend to any other sports that have sort of these higher valued uh, statistics. So I think that this is a great way of drafting sort of embracing analytics and creating a game that's actually designed for analytical players rather than just being good at uh, targeted by analytical players. Thank you. We open up to the judges. So wh why do you think DraftKings, like what's the biggest reason, like the biggest value for DraftKings to do this, to offer this? I, I think there are two things. One is I think getting more uh, analytical users who are currently on other platforms to their platform. I think if they hear about a competition like this or a contest like this where they feel they can um, sort of succeed by applying new methods, that it will drive them there. And the second is um, more games to play for current competitors. So like... Um, so like, basically, you think it's like a potentially like a good customer acquisition tool and also potentially a good revenue, like new revenue source. Yeah, totally. And then I think there is, I didn't talk about it here, I think there is value in it being on onboarding for non-analytical players too, um, mainly because current fantasy is, is confusing if you've never played it before. And you think this is simpler? I, I do, and I'll tell you why. I think it's simpler because the ask is very simple. It's choose 10 players and predict how well they're going to do in this stat and the closer you are, the better you get. There's not a formula of it's 1.5 plus steals minus three times turnovers, et cetera. It's just predict the given statistic for that player. Um, so at least it's like interpretable in that way. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, so I, I know you explained this and I, I may have missed it. So are you choosing the stat that you want or in this, in this pitch or is it, is it set up like field goal attempts and then you can just choose the players is, is the idea that you can choose everything? No, uh, DraftKings chooses the stat. Okay. That can vary from contest to contest, but it's the same for every competitor in a contest. One challenge that I see, or I'd, I'd like your, your answer on this, is that I think for, you know, you, you talk about the volume, right? And so people that play, that, that do volume, at least and certainly in DFS, you know, they, they have tools and they will, they will set 150 lineups, right? Mm -hmm. And it won't take them that long because mm -hmm. they'll, you know, they'll, I want 20% of Patrick Mahomes and I want, you know, 15% of Carson Wentz and all my lineups, that kind of thing. Sure. How do you, if you have to basically enter 10, 10 numbers, right, for every lineup, mm -hmm. I think field goal attempts, I think this guy gets 22, I think this guy gets 14. How do you, my concern or the challenge here is how do you get multiple entries? Like that's going to, is there a way to cut down on the time of that, if that makes any sense? Yeah, that, that does make sense. I think from like a casual perspective, entering multiple lineups gets worse. Obviously it's, it takes longer, but for these analytical competitors, uh, it's just, I think, changing a couple lines of their code to output a prediction along with the player they choose. And then when you uh, import that CSV, it'll just have that extra data. It shouldn't, I, I hope that they're not manually setting it. Um, yeah. So here's, here's my take on your idea. This reminds me a lot of, so uh, in my life I've played a little bit of blackjack. Yeah. And so there is these terrible bets that they offer you at blackjack, which yeah, is like sure. the five card bonus or whatever. Yeah. So you do your DFS lineup and then you can opt into the whatever, predict thing, right? And you can either fill it out yourself or you can default to whatever the like predicted should be. And if you happen to hit whatever, 100% of the predicted, you get like some big payoff. So it's like a lottery ticket kind of idea, 
but if someone really wants to spend time, they can do it, right? And it's just an additional, so then it just becomes an additional revenue source for DraftKings. That's interesting. And it's in like a lottery, free lottery ticket for the player. Right, so that would be on the current competition you add. Yeah, this just, you just add a column and you can opt into it. Like you're like, oh, do you want to yeah. add an additional dollar to be entered into this? Thing? It's, it's interesting. The thing I worry about that, like you're saying, is those, all those um, plays at Blackjack, apart from the actual game, those are all negative EV. Uh, well, I mean, everything we're talking about is negative EV. Otherwise, DraftKings wouldn't offer it. Well, that's that's true, but it's uh, from the analytical player's perspective. I feel like that's more transparently negative EV, but maybe not. Maybe they would. But like, no one DraftKings is not making. Well, long term, they're not making money off analytical people, right? That's the reality. Yeah, I get, yeah, that's true. They make money from more people on the platform. Yeah, they make money from people losing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And are you expecting basically a 10% rake, like standard? Yeah, standard with whatever the current uh, competitions are. And that's kind of a nice thing, too, is I think it's relatively easy to implement no major uh, or super major changes that DraftKings would have to perform. So yeah. I was just going to echo Jeff's comments and say, you know, one of the, the cool vehicles for something like this could be, even if you didn't rake it, have it be something that's a progressive jackpot. And so there could be days and days where no one hits it, right? And mm. what makes this so exciting would be maybe a contest that's normally 20000 for the actual core DFS product now has a progressive jackpot has grown to even be bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And now more and more people want to opt into it. It becomes a more attractive game that they'll play the actual DFS piece and this add-on because of the implied value now of that yeah, contest that's, that's interesting. In, its, in a vacuum is now plus mm -hmm. EV because of that uh, accrued um, jackpot. That's yeah, yeah, I really like that idea, yeah. yeah. Cool, thanks so much. Asher, thank you very much. <laughs> We're down to our fifth and final presenters, first team actually. From UMass, Jack Burney, as well as Jack Petrides. Coming up. Um. But uh, my name's Jack. My partner's name is also Jack. <laughs> and uh, here we go. Uh, how's it going, everybody? Uh, as he said, we are Jack and Jack, uh, Jack Squared, if you like. Uh, we are going uh, here, you hold on to the clicker. Uh, we are going to be talking about our uh, daily fantasy game, DraftKings Shot Caller. So what Shot Caller really brings to the table is its ability to keep fans engaged uh, on the platform longer than traditional daily fantasy. So with traditional fantasy, you might set a lineup and then uh, check back the next day to see whether or not you won. Uh, but with Shot Caller, you're engaged on the app throughout the duration of your contest, which really is what separates this from uh, other options. It also brings in this second screen companion idea where you're watching the game with your phone, with your tablet, your laptop, open on the Shot Caller app which just helps uh, in sort of today, we all have short attention spans, so especially with baseball, ratings have been declining. If you're watching baseball, maybe you're someone who plays uh, DraftKings football, but doesn't, isn't usually active on the site during MLB season. This provides you a way to get a little more excitement while watching this baseball game. Uh, maybe also while you're watching, your friends ask you about it, it drives more traffic to the DraftKings site. And this platform is ideal not just for in-home watching on TV, but also for in-stadium which uh, we think will yield some really cool opportunities that Jack's going to talk about in a little bit. Yeah, so let's just, ooh, loud. Uh, let's just hop into the logistics here. Um, so the whole premise of Shot Caller is predicting the at-bats um, in a certain single MLB game contest. You're scored against fellow players within your contest, and it's a paid entry, skill-based game housed on the DraftKings Fantasy tab. Um, and the reason we went with baseball is because of its segmented gameplay. So there's time between each at-bat, uh, and you have the opportunity to predict uh, in the future for, for each at-bat. And we think that there are also some uh, avenues for expansion that I'll touch on further. So now more specifically in the rules, a player can shot call from three basic outcomes. Those outcomes are, are a hit, a base without hit, or an out. You can stay there, earn points for correctly predicting that outcome, or you could specify further to try and earn more points. For example, for the hit outcome, you could specify single, double, triple, home run. 
Um, and, and getting both of those selections correct, you'd earn more points. However, if you miss a component of the specification, zero points are awarded. Additionally, you can pre-select up to three at-bats, so you can kind of stay on top of the game flow. If uh, Verlander's mowing down batters, you can kind of just stay up, to, stay, up to ba stay up to date on it. And additionally, if you miss an at-bat, zero points are awarded, so no penalty there. You just don't get the opportunity to earn points. So now here's some of the scoring. Yeah, so really the meat of the idea comes down to the scoring system, uh, which we built on the idea that an out is the most likely outcome of any plate appearance and all the other uh, scoring values are extrapolated based on their relative probabilities. So for example, uh, we found out that an out is roughly three times more likely than a hit, so a hit's gonna be around three points. Additionally, a triple is the least likely outcome that you're gonna see, so a triple is a whopping 204 points. Um, these values were calculated based on the per 600 plate appearance uh, statistics of all major league hitters last season. We use these values to insulate the game from unfair arbitrage or people trying to game the system by, say, selecting out every time, hoping to gain a steady uh, flow of points, or even picking triple every time, hoping that one hit would rocket them to the top of the leaderboard, because again, this is a daily fantasy option. But based on these point values, you're not gonna get ahead that way. You really need to use strategy and have a knowledge of baseball, because again, this is a skill-based game. So using that knowledge of baseball, these stats are based on the average hitter. So if you're an experienced fan, you know that a star or a really great batter is up to, up to the plate, you're gonna have a statistical advantage picking hit. Additionally, it's critical to understand game scenarios. So if it's, there's a man on third with one out, sacrifice fly might be the call. Or if the pitcher's been uh, pitching for ground balls all night, specifying ground out over air out is a great strategy. If Jose Altuve comes to bat this season, Hit by pitch might be the way to go. Um, but again, it is a skill-based game. This isn't a sports book. The user is competing against, is against each other, the, um, not against DraftKings. So DraftKings is not setting lines. DraftKings is not setting betting odds. Uh, the points, like Daily Fantasy, add up to, on a leaderboard. And the winner, at the end of the night, is who has the most points. And ultimately, uh, obviously, uh, DraftKings is the winner in the end. <laughs> Um, so this is what our interface would look like. This is what the user is seeing while they're on the app, but this is their second screen experience. So up top, it gives a little bit of game scenario information and also points uh, based on how you're doing in this competition. You have the option to make your shot call, hit out base without hit, and then specify if you so choose to single, double, triple, or home run. You can also take advantage, like Jack said, of our pre-selection feature to move ahead and, and try to get ahead of the competition if you, if you see a trend developing. So now kind of looking forward, and it's also important to add on that these contests can be for one, three, five, or nine innings, so you're not locked in for the marathon game. Um, and we see expansion opportunities for the PGA Tour, NFL, and other global sports, maybe cricket. Um, similar to baseball, these, these sports have segmented gameplay, um, and there's a basis for uh, predicting the outcomes of plays, shots, uh, and so on. We also think that there's a possibility for in-stadium contests via geolocating and geofencing, where we pitch actual people in the stadium against other people in the stadium against each other. Um, we think that that would be a fun way to uh, just generate more interest and excitement, um, especially with the advent of 5G technology and maybe even premium Wi-Fi benefits for the DraftKings users. Um, to that same extent, uh, DraftKings could partner with broadcasters and streaming entities to kind of create improved uh, broadcasting scenarios for these new sports. For instance, the PGA Tour, it's tough to follow a specific golfer or watch a specific hole for, every four, for all four rounds, so this streaming platform could be created. I know NBC Gold just, just started to make one of their own, and, and the PGA specifically has uh, emphasized its interest in uh, expanding into the gaming and gambling realm. Um, and then one of my favorites is the progressive jackpot opportunity. So Jack and I envision this as a growing jackpot that, uh, that grows through all DraftKings shot caller contests, where if a player, say, correctly predicts 27 outcomes in a row, shot calling the perfect game, they win this grand prize jackpot, generates word of mouth, it has your lottery element of excitement, and uh, it's a good story uh, from start to finish. So thank you for listening to our DraftKings shot caller pitch. We'd love to answer some of your questions. We open it up to the judges. So 
there's a lot of what I I see a lot of what do you guys see as the biggest challenge for doing this like making this a mainstream idea um, that's a good question I think uh, probably the biggest challenge is just finding that audience uh, who isn't looking to do uh, live betting and isn't also looking to do traditional fantasy because we are sort of an in between uh, but we think that audience is out there, especially with baseball. Um, and we think with the sort of the second screen companion, there's a lot of opportunities to sort of drive that excitement. How long do you think the window will be to make your shot call? The average time between at bats is about 20 seconds. So we think that you can adequately do it in that time, as well as using the pre-select function to. Uh, okay. Do you know how long the latency is on a typical broadcast? Uh, so we looked into that, and it, it depends, I think, on the uh, on the platform. But for most of the time, you'll only have uh, between a, a half second to a seven second delay. Uh, the seven second it's is much longer than that. The typical, especially with OTT now, the typical delay can be up to thirty seconds. So that kind of kills that twenty second window. Uh, yeah, it certainly does. Uh, but in in the future, we sort of see uh, the geofencing option as well, where we would really uh, segment the in-stadium play from the TV play, where the TV play. It's a really good in-stadium in -stadium idea, but I don't think it works with broadcast, unfortunately, because if the broadcast is too, it's too. Maybe eventually it will, but right now it's like too long. Too delayed. Yeah, well, that, that's also maybe where we see our uh, specific shot caller streaming network come into play. Uh, we, we intended that for, for golf um, originally, but it also, we would hope to expand it to baseball. Just uh, <clears throat> going off of the screen that you guys showed in terms of what you, you know, one thing that I noticed off that screen, I don't know if you can go back to it or not, but um, yeah. So I'm just trying to figure out like, where do you, where do I challenge somebody? Where am I, where do I see my score? How do I, so I see I'm 17th out of 100. I've scored 38.68 points. Is it like, but I'm playing against a pool, right? It's not a head-to-head -head competition, right? I'm playing against a pool. Yeah, so you can enter a head-to-head -head competition. You can do a double up, a tournament-based thing. Um, so you're, you're, pool, you're, you're, excuse me, you're competing against people, predicting the outcomes of at-bats within the same MLB game, within the same type of contest. So it could be like where you only win if you're in the top 10 of the 100 that joined or if you're top five of the 10, whatever it is. Yeah, no, and, and obviously this is sort of a, you know, as we know over in Europe, like, you know, in-game uh, gambling is, is huge, obviously, and so this is sort of like, again, another sort of gateway, uh, you know. I agree, with, I agree with Jeff, I think it's a, uh, it's a really fun thing to do in, in stadium, um, and I actually think that layout looks really, really nice. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Don't listen to Jeff crushing your dreams. There's ways around everything. No, I mean, like, you're, uh, the, uh, the in play activation is, like, really smart, right? And also, the way you guys are thinking about it is really smart. But unfortunately, it, it will not work on a broadcast right now. But you guys can push for better, you know, connectivity or better streaming service and you create your own network where this is the reason to do it. So, like, we're pushing. It, yeah, no, and I was, just, I was just going to say, especially when you think about specifically DraftKings that has so many sponsorship deals in stadiums and with teams, you know, on all the sports, it makes a really, I, I mean, as a way to just sort of start to get people playing in-game and playing in-stadium and just engaging with the DraftKings band while they're watching the game. And, you know, I, to me, that's, the, to me, that's the, the initial path, at least. Yeah, so it's a, it's a lot like uh, live betting, right? Each, each turn you're taking. So how do, you, how do you get over the hurdle of this is a skill-based game specifically? Um, we think with our scoring system, uh, it really comes down to that knowledge of baseball because if you're just making picks like you would with a traditional sports bet, uh, the, they're all going to sort of even out in the end. And it's really about understanding not only uh, probabilities, but scenarios, like I said with the, the sacrifice fly. Uh, sacrifice fly doesn't occur very often, which is why it has a high point yield. But it, when it does occur, it's often easy to foresee if you're an experienced fan. Uh, so it, it's things like that that have that, that skill element where it, uh, it leans more towards the, the fantasy side than the sports book side. And one comment, I think, to the point on the, on the uh, latency on the broadcast, um, you, you would just need to use actual just the like live betting feeds to you could do this just digitally with like a, you know, with just the feeds, but you wouldn't be able to like actually watch it off a of TV, but you could potentially do it, but you wouldn't be looking real time like people uh, sport a bet today. 
Right, yeah, we, we definitely, we love it ideally as a second screen, but that's why we also try to include as much information at the top so someone could be just following along on their phone or their, their tablet or whatever with that, that screen as their only uh, window into the game. We have that issue today. You're asking if we should not let people play based on them being baseball experts? Well, I guess part of the challenge was that you're saying you kind of have to be an experienced baseball fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we're hoping that with 5G and possibly some in-stadium Wi-Fi improvements across the country, that that wouldn't be a problem, because we did talk about uh, connectivity issues in state. It's, it's a very, so I, I work with ACC right now, and one of the things that we're thinking about is, does this application, i.e. sports betting, create an opportunity where, like, the, the previously, like, all that was happening in stadiums was social media and email, so the owners basically care, right? So I'm like, well, fan base around a reason to care and like if you partner with the DraftKings to potentially help build out the infrastructure and be the presenting sponsor of a game this is a really unique opportunity so yeah and back to your point about tiering levels of people playing I think that's most certainly possible if you could just aggregate the total points that the players earned over their kind of experience within this game then they could be in tier one versus tier three we could come up with fancy names for them too well, thank you guys for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to the Jacks. Well, thanks once again. Congratulations once again to all of our finalists. Judges, as you know, you have some tough choices ahead of you here. And... Uh, I ask that you begin deliberating, tallying up your scores. You'll have a little bit of time to do so. And uh, while our judges do deliberate, I want to bring all of our teams and presenters back up here. So if you could all join me back here, that'd be great. All of you did an incredible job this morning. If you guys want to give them one more round of applause. As I mentioned last year, a lot of fun, very innovative this year. Obviously, you guys just continue to set the bar higher and higher, so something we look forward to in future years. Don't forget also, as our judges deliberate, I mentioned earlier, DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins will be joined by fellow industry leaders on a couple of different panels today. One of those coming up in just a little while, 11 a.m., so in about an hour, you have the uh, Start Me Up Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Jason will be speaking there also a little bit later on today at 4 p.m., Fanalytics 2.0. Those are both in the Bill James room right upstairs. We hope you can join us. Momentarily, we'll tell you what our judges have to say.
Suspense is over. Our judges are back. I want to remind people that first place, and we will find out momentarily, $2,000 team cash prize, an internship with DraftKings, and lunch with DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins. Second place, four tickets to a basketball or baseball game, $500 team cash prize. And third place, four tickets to a basketball or baseball game and a $250 team cash prize. So with that, I'd like to ask all the judges to come up here, if you would. A lot of up and down, I know. Matt LaRue is going to present our third, second, and of course, first place winners. Thanks again, guys. Um, you know, really, again, to echo Matthew's comments, you, know, you all did a really great job, and it was very difficult to select the winners. So um, thanks again. So um, with third place, uh, we are going with Shot Caller uh, by Jack Petrides and Jack Burney. So, congratulations, guys. Second place, we went with the Profit uh, product for Asher Wright. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, please join me in congratulating our first place winner with the prize linked savings accounts, Liz Bloom from Harvard Business School. <laughs> so thanks again. All the presentations were terrific, so let's just give it up for all the contestants. And uh, thanks again, guys. We'd like to ask all the Contestants, come back up here one more time for a picture with the judges. I'm sure you don't mind. Congratulations once again to everybody. Thank you to everyone for joining us this morning. And uh, obviously, we encourage you once again, Jason Robbins, our CEO, will be speaking on a couple of panels today, the first of which is coming up at 11 o'clock in the Bill James Room upstairs.